My dog Joey and I are sitting here in the hollow of a hundred-year-old cottonwood tree. We call him Grandfather. I've been coming over to spend time with this tree every day now for 30 years. I'm intrigued that we think it's nothing unusual to talk to our dogs, but people think you're crazy if you begin talking to trees. <laughs> I'm Belden Lane, author of a book entitled The Great Conversation, Nature and the Care of the Soul. I'm a retired university professor and wilderness backpacker who's been intrigued with the idea of interspecies communication for a long time. And it all began with this tree. Grandfather is a male eastern cottonwood. He and I met three day, decades ago at a time of mutual crisis. My mother was in a nursing home dying of cancer. He was dealing with a lightning strike that had just struck down one of the two great trunks growing from his roots. A 12 foot high wound was left here in his side. That's what first drew me to him. A common hurt opened the door between us. A shared vulnerability is the first requirement for any deep and honest communication. Now, Thomas Berry complained that we as humans have dropped out of the great conversation. We've lost our ability to converse with the rest of the natural world. He mourned that we talk only to ourselves. We're not talking to the rivers. We aren't listening to the wind or the stars. We've broken the great conversation. William Blake in 19th century London lamented the fact that the tree which moves some to tears of joy is in the eyes of others only a green thing that stands in the way. For thousands of years, trees have energized our myths and fired our imagination. The Druids pulled their wisdom from the ancient oaks. The Celts found magical properties in gnarled old yew trees from which we're deriving cancer treatments today. In the Middle Ages, a nun named Hildegard of Bingen said she heard an unknown language and unheard music coming from trees and shrubs. She composed an alphabet for this hidden language, giving names to over 800 plants. She was fascinated by the healing power of everything green. The Baal Shem Tov, an 18th century Hasidic Rebbe was said to have spoken 26 different languages, not just Hebrew, Yiddish, and Polish. He knew the languages of birds, trees, animals, plants, and clouds as well. And yet we've turned our backs on this ancient human practice of connecting intimately with the rest of nature, and trees in particular. Today, tree biologists like Suzanne Samard are showing us how trees communicate with each other through mycorrhizal fungi, uh, pheromones, and electrical impulses. And tree enthusiasts like uh, actor Judy Dench in a recent BBC documentary show how trees reach out to touch the human spirit as well. Novelist Richard Powers won the Pulitzer Prize year before last for The Overstory, an absolutely stunning book about trees. Now, what I'd like to share is something of my own experience in connecting with grandfather, this tree that I love. The two of us communicate in a uh, nonverbal, very sensuous way. When I go over there every evening leaning into Grandfather's Hollow, I take joy in touching and being touched by him. We connect to the play of imagination and reverie operating through the senses. You, you might ask what specifically happens between the two of us as we communicate? Well, I don't possess any paranormal skills in listening to trees. I don't hear anything more than what you'd hear. I just spend a lot of time in silence with this tree. When I'm there, I move into a practice of stillness, letting go of, of thoughts and words into a contemplative silence. And once in a while, something comes up. 
Is it from inside me or inside him? I never know for sure. It may be just a sense of feeling utterly at home in his hollow. Or it may be a thought that comes to me like, just stand there. What you really need will come to you. That's just like what a tree would say. Grandfather, of course, can't go anywhere for what he needs. He has to wait for everything to come to him. And that's something I need so often to hear as well. And even when nothing passes between us, being there is an end in itself. That's how it is with anything you love. Let me share a story about how I was initially introduced to this idea of talking to trees. It happened right at the time of grandfather's wounding and my mother's dying. As an only child about to lose a last parent, I'd made an overnight backpacking trip into the Missouri Ozarks. On a March afternoon, I hiked into a place called Lower Rock Creek. A stream there flows down a canyon cut through the rough terrain of the St. Francis Mountains. A week earlier, there'd been a 12-inch snowfall followed by a thaw and heavy rain bringing a flash flood uh, careening down the gorge. As I walked in, I could see branches and debris high over my head in the tree limbs. The memory of violent rushing water still lingered. Downstream, I found a place to camp, set up my tent and built a small fire, eating supper as the sun was setting. Sitting there, I noticed a small pine tree across the fire from me. Hadn't noticed it before and I said hello. I wasn't accustomed to talking to trees at the time. I've learned better since then. And then the reverie evoked by the fire, I imagined the tree responding back saying, uh, why don't you tell us a story? That's what kids do, after all, when you're gathered around a campfire. Now, I'd never told a story to a tree before, but I liked the idea, especially as I thought of a Lakota tale about death and transformation that I love. Now, a storyteller has to adjust his tale to his listeners, of course, and there were certain things I had to explain to the tree that he or she might not understand in the process of telling. Uh, it was a challenge at first, but I had a sense that we were both getting into it. Night was coming on as I picked up another handful of sticks to put on the fire. The light blazed up as I noticed three or four other little trees gathered around the fire. I could have sworn they hadn't been there earlier when I'd set up camp. I suspected they snuck in to listen to the story. As a storyteller, I don't ever remember being listened to as carefully as I was that night by those trees. I was stunned by the intensity with I, which I imagined them listening to the tale, trying to understand what might explain their attentive, attentiveness. I realized for one thing that they'd never heard a story before. Very few people wander into this remote stretch of wilderness, mostly hunters, maybe a few backpackers people who aren't accustomed to telling stories to trees. So it was a novelty to them. Then I also realized the trees knew what I was talking about as they listened to a tale about death and transformation. They'd just survived a flash flood sweeping over them. Amazingly, they hadn't been uprooted. And moreover, they were surrounded by death, growing out of the rotted remains of grandfathers and grandmothers before them. And yet I knew that there must be something still more about the fascination that drew them to the story. At last, I caught on that they were watching the fire along with me. None of these trees had ever seen flames before. There was no indication that a forest fire had ever swept through the area or that a campfire had been built there. The hair rose on the back of my neck as I realized these trees were listening to a story about their own death and transformation as they watched wood burn. Seeing the stuff of their own being transformed into flickering flames of orange, red, and yellow, and then left as a light gray ash blown away by the wind. This was my first experience of communicating with trees. 
while they never spoke a word. The exchange between us was as powerful as anything I'd known. What made it possible, as I look back on it now, was a mutual convergence of vulnerabilities. Hearing the story as the trees heard it, I was carried more deeply into my own untapped grief at the time. I was offered a new sense of community, shared across an interspecies boundary, bridged by mutual loss. What I'm saying in all this is that in this present moment of our vast ecological loss, it's more important than ever that we connect with this wider community. It is time for us to rejoin the great conversation. May it be so.